Hi, everyone. This is James Donaldson, CEO of Copperhead, and I'd like to introduce this interview I did in the past with the Ethical Developer Group. The interview topics span over multiple subjects, including free software, battling misinformation online about Copperhead, open source business models, and others. So thanks for tuning in, and be sure to leave a comment and some feedback on your thoughts. So I'm Mark Marash with Ethical Developer Group. Uh, we've got a lot of interest in privacy. Our motto is freeing you from the digital panopticon. We are very interested in the fact that um, a lot of our digital devices and apps and such spy on us. So we're very interested in privacy-based uh, mobile phones and apps and such. And um, so those are of interest to us. And um, about, uh, I suppose, a year and a half, two years ago, I bought a Nexus 6P with the intent of running Copperhead OS on it. And I did run it for uh, over a year. And um, I quit doing about a year ago. But, you know, I'd like to find out more about what the latest is with Copperhead OS. And thankfully, today... Um, or within the past week, James Donaldson, founder of Copperhead. Is, is that the right term, James? Founder? Yep, founder and CEO. All right. So James Donaldson, founder and CEO, contacted me uh, wanting to talk about Copperhead. So we've got an opportunity today to find out more. So uh, James, would you like to just go ahead and get started on giving the basics of Copperhead? Sure. Copperhead is a, and thanks very much, Mark, for having me on. I appreciate it and responding to my, my request. Um, Copperhead is a cybersecurity firm uh, headquartered in Toronto, Ontario, specializing in secure operating systems and source available software. Uh, Copperhead OS is, uh, is now about three or four years old. Um, started off uh, based on CyanogenMod mod and was running for on the Samsung S4s and Nexus 5s with the intention of porting over uh, unofficial ports of GR security and, and PACs, which are, are deeply technical exploit mitigation techniques from Linux hardening, uh, server hardening techniques over to Android to see if it's possible. Uh, we were qu quite successful. Uh, we eventually rebased off of the Android open source project uh, two or three years ago, and that was our first release, uh, Copper OS Beta, which was put on Nexus 5Xs and Nexus 5s. Uh, we eventually moved to start selling devices on our website as well as providing free uh, images on our website for download for the Nexus 5X and Nexus 6P, as Mark uh, has met, Mark demonstrated. Uh, a year later, we, we continued on supporting uh, the latest hardware from Google, which would be the Pixel 1, Pixel XL. And two years after that would be the Pixel 2 and Pixel 2 XL, um, with a focus on uh, a little bit of a license change and focusing on uh, business to business contracts, uh, support and service. And um, considering I'm the business development salesperson of Copperhead, uh, that's very much one of my focuses. And I will do my best to answer any technical questions, but I'm very much the, the sales, the sales guy. So I'm probably uh, more uh, attuned to answering the questions regarding Copperhead OS's sustainability, Copperhead's profitability, and uh, stuff around the company. All right, great. Um, so that gives us a good feeling for kind of the basics of Copperhead. So it over time, my understanding is that you, the approach to your business has changed. Um, I think I saw an interview from a couple of years ago where at one point you were talking about, well, we'll create this open source operating system and put it out there and then people will contact us for um, support and that sort of thing and licensing. And I, I think you ran into issues with that approach, right? Yeah, um, we definitely did. Uh, originally, uh, when Copper OS was first released for the 5X and the 6P, it was uh, released in perm on permissive licensing. Um, of course, depending on the upstream licensing, you know, the Linux kernel stuff and any of the Linux kernel hardening is all GPL licensed. So that has to be open source and, uh, and put online. Uh, but a lot, a lot of our user space changes were, were license permissive. And we thought, um, you know, coming from my consulting background and my, some of my, the technical assets in Copperhead believe that, you know, if we came out with this technology and yeah, you know, one or two people would download it. And if they're part of a company they'd say, Hey, this is really cool. We should support this company. Let's donate. Let's get support contracts. Um, you know, a year into that, we found that to be quite a naive assumption. Um, you know, we, I started processing, uh, I'm, 
conversations, communications from people that were selling hundreds of devices um, when we only sold a couple hundred uh, Nexus 5Xs and 6Ps off our website. So we had some resellers, especially overseas, we had some resellers who were making way more money than we were and uh, weren't pitching anything back. You know, Obviously, we weren't in this and we're not in this to be quadrillionaires, but um, you got to keep the lights on. Uh, you know, We live in Toronto, which is one of the most expensive places in the world to live. Um, mm-hmm. And to keep the lights on uh, is expensive. So uh, we ran into issues and you know, we, we found that even though we changed our licensing in October 2016 to Creative Commons non-commercial share-like attribution, uh, we found that people still violated the license and was still you know, selling devices uh, for commercial purposes, was, were providing commercial services on top of it and charging for it. And we're not really uh, processing anything back to the company. So in the first year of operation, we're donation based. Uh, we barely cleared a hundred thousand in revenue. Uh, a year later, we uh, increased our top line over two hundred percent, and that was with the addition of the non-commercial licensing. Because the way co- uh, companies work is, if you're an, if you're a reputable company with investors and you and you like to do things above board, which most companies would, they will go through their product suites and their solutions and say, okay. How do we stay compliant? This, the, you know, this product is licensed non-commercial. Therefore, we have to approach Copperhead and say, "Hey, how do we get a licensing arrangement?" So it worked out better for us then, but we we did keep in, encountering issues for sure. Um, it's hard to sell support for an end user device uh, when you can go on Reddit, make a, a throwaway account with one post, which asks the question, and then you get your answer. It's kind of hard to generate business that way. All right. Yeah. Um... One thing that popped up, speaking of Reddit, is um, <laughs> you knew this was coming. Oh, right? yeah. <laughs> so there was apparently some sort of a falling out. I, I know I shouldn't read too much into what I see out there on the Internet, Reddit. Who knows who's saying what, on what account, what the truth is to anything. So figured I would just go ahead and ask you, was there some sort of a falling out within the company? Um, and what happened with that? Yeah, so I mean, a falling out is a is a polite way of putting it, a nice, light, gentle touch of putting it. Um, yeah, last year, uh, Daniel McKay, who was then the CTO of Copperhead, and myself had a, a a longstanding internal dispute that kind of turned for much, much worse and became very public. Unfortunately, uh, revolving around multiple issues. He used uh, company marketing channels such as the Copper to West Twitter account and the Copper to West subreddit to essentially slander me and air dirty laundry. Um, and uh, even though we, we we tried to negotiate through lawyers and tried to get things resolved amicably, it had ended up with the Copper to West signing keys being destroyed and uh, him being exited from the company. Ooh, okay. Yeah. Ugly indeed. Yeah. It, and any little startup is going to have some dirty laundry and stuff. I, I don't know what was aired exactly, but um, all I know is there's some ugly stuff and um, there was a falling out. And when I saw that happen and then um, I quit seeing updates for my Nexus 6P, I, mm-hmm. I switched over to Lineage OS saying, well, let's, let's let, things go where they're going but regardless of me um you know i i suppose we'll just see um whether i i decide to go and build a copy so i can go back onto it with the uh nexus 6p again but regardless that that gives me a feel kind of for what happened and um has this made any changes to the way you run the company the results <laughs> yeah absolutely i would i would be uh I wouldn't be doing my job correctly as a CEO if I didn't learn my lesson from that. Um, you know, uh, when we started the business, uh, Daniel McKay was brought in a little bit later when after Copper was formed, and then he was brought in when we were incorporated. Um, we were running this, you know, we're three privacy respecting hackers, right? I, you know, I knew the other two members, Daniel and the other the other fellow from running crypto parties in Toronto. So we very much were privacy hackers, open source people. Definitely no business background, definitely no corporate structure background, nothing to do with, um, you know, understanding how to properly set up a corporation in, in case, you know, dispute happens, which inevitably they always do. People say whatever they want to say and do whatever they want to do. And we need regulation to kind of keep them and keep everyone happy and at least moving in the same direction. 
Um, so the two big changes that we made is one, operationally, uh, you know, no one's going to be able to be onboarded into Copperhead and, and, and given sort of the ability to bottleneck the, co- the company into any sort of issues because of whatever personal grievances they have. Uh, you know, if, a comp- if the company is moving forward in a positive direction, in a profitable direction, an ethical direction, we want to make sure we keep doing that no matter what someone, you know, if one person comes in and says, hey, well, I don't like this because of the way I feel, you know, if they can't back their, their evidence up with some empirical data, then it really doesn't really matter. And on a technical aspect, uh, the signing keys were, you know, recreated and we rebooted in July 2018, which is about a year, uh, sorry, a month and a half after the signing key destruction with uh, signing key policy and procedures. Uh, the signing keys have been uh, copied and are left in uh, numerous places just in case something happens. If something is to happen to the new CTL or myself, uh, company policy will will in- engage and the signing keys will be retrieved and updates will continue. All right. Interesting. Okay, cool. And um, let's see. So I was looking at which devices are supported. I was actually kind of surprised to see that it was still pretty much um, pretty much the same list I saw before. Mm-hmm. Um, is there a reason you haven't uh, that you're not uh, covering Pixel Three or higher? Well, I suppose Pixel Four isn't quite out yet, but it's not out yet. We want to see what it looks like. Um, yeah, the Pixel Three and the Pixel Three A especially are, are very compelling devices for security reasons. Uh, we haven't supported any extra devices because uh, you know for last year we've very much been you know, climbing out of the ashes of, of what was what was uh, processed before. And we really wanted to make sure that the uh, su- the hardware support of our Pixel and Pixel 2 customers was getting up to speed. Uh, you know, we had some ups and downs. Um, you know, with when you lose your CTO, when you lose your main technical asset, uh, you lose a lot of the company, it, to say the least. So um, we've very much been concentrating on taking care of our previous customers before onboarding a massive amounts of... Uh, future ones, but I'm happy to say that we've pretty much covered that now. So we're looking at supporting the Pixel 3 starting October. That's going to coincide with our upgrade to Android 10 with all of our security features from Copper to West. And, excuse me, um, what's very exciting to uh, speak about, even though I can't speak too much about it, is we're coming out and while we've been working on for last year, a way to actually get the operating system to your device uh, without you needing to buy hardware. Uh, to be something similar to the Nexus 6P and 5X images, except they won't be free, unless, of course, you work for a nonprofit or you're a journalist like yourself. Um, it'll be involving a licensing mechanism that uh, uh, enables you to have an active commercial license on your device without providing device identifying information from the device, meaning that we can finally uh, sell commercial licenses and operating system downloads for Copper OS. Wow, interesting. Okay, cool. Um, <coughs> bless you. Yeah, thanks. So, so yeah, so others are coming. Other phones are coming, and that'll be good. Um, and you're sticking to the um, the Google phones primarily. Is it just because of some of the functions that they offer? Yeah. Um, w- we were looking at some of the Xiaomi phones previously. Um, you know, some of them have issues where, you know, you can or you can't unlock the bootloader. And for a Copper to West device, um, we're very much insistent that the device uh, integrity is able to be verified internally all the way up the stack, uh, as you have with, you know, 5X all the way up to Pixel 3. Um, but when uh, Google came out with the Pixel 3a, we felt that, you know, a, uh, a mid-range device with uh, a hardware security module the exact same one that's in Pixel 3 uh, for you know, less of a price tag. So you have all the security. Maybe you don't get all the nice, fancy hardware features, but you got all the security and updates for um, you know a couple hundred dollars. We felt that was a fantastic offering by Google. So that's definitely our next uh, target. Um, and really, it's up to OEMs. Uh, you know, we'd be, We're approached by OEMs all the time to uh, port Copper to West over to customized devices. And we find that a lot of OEMs, even the bigger ones like Xiaomi or ZTE, uh, have issues with uh, maintaining a, 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 a standard of security. Um, so, you know, we're cool supporting what we, what, you know, the flagship devices, um, but they really have to have a standard of security that, that matches Copper OS and what Copper OS is known for. All right. All right. Cool. Um... So there are some other options out there for having security phones 
and um, I'd like to get your information on how they stand, uh, how they stack up. Now, one of the common things that you'll often see people go for is they'll just do what I did after Copperhead OS before and just load up Lineage OS and leave off the um, leave off the Google Apps, which is probably most of what people are interested in doing. But but what are people missing? by going after something like Lineage OS? Yeah, so um, Lineage OS is, in my in my opinion, one of, if not the most important Android projects on the planet right now. And that's because they are the largest non-Google Android project uh, in the world. So um, a lot of the... A lot of the technical restructuring we did was because we hired actually the top Lineage, Lineage OS uh, staff. Oh. Uh, and they're very talented. They're very, um, they're very genuine, good hearted people. You know, they're open source people, but they have a knack for understanding business. So we have a lot of respect and I have a lot of personal respect for Lineage OS. Um, so, you know, if, if, if someone was to say to me, Hey, James, you know, how do you feel about Lineage? Well, I'd say, you know, Lineage does great work and putting Lineage on your phone is, 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 is good. And it, you know, they do stuff like free security updates for devices that don't even get them anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and you might not get the full firmware update, um, you know, which, uh, you know, it, some people, including my ex CTO would say is disingenuous, but I think that working, you know, for free on devices and giving people who maybe can't afford, you know, $1,200 devices, free security updates is, is great. Fantastic way to get back. So, um, you know, what do they know now? The difference between lineage OS and copper OS is lineage OS is about device support, making sure device is stable. And, you know, trying to do interesting things with, with, with different types of hardware. Copper OS is privacy and security focused, right? So Copper OS has security mechanisms that Lineage OS won't have and, uh, and doesn't have, you know, such as our port of the OpenBSD memory allocator, such as our exec spawning, anything that essentially makes it uh, harder for someone to write a complete exploit chain for the device. Uh, Lineage doesn't have this, uh, but Copper OS does. All right, cool. Um, I'm seeing some other options starting to pop up out there that uh, will get people down below a thousand dollars. Yeah, I, I've done the research, and there's a lot of phones out there. The sky's the limit mm -hmm. on how much you want to pay mm -hmm. to uh, get some sort of a great privacy phone. One of the other options that's popped up, that I thought I'd get your opinion on, is the uh, Librem Five, which is being offered by the Pure, the folks who created Pure OS. Yeah. Yeah. Purism. Um, we, uh, we just, you know, we had a few discussions with Purism. Uh, I've spoken to Todd Weaver, the CEO multiple times. Um, and, uh, I feel like they're doing good work. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Linux dude. I appreciate open source. Um, now in terms of how that stands up against say a copper OS pixel two, I would say it's incomparable. Uh, pixel two copper OS is one of the most secure Android devices on the planet. Hmm. Um, Librem Purism, you know, P Librem five, you know, I don't want to speak for Purism, but I think their focus is on trying to make a completely open stack or as open as possible of a stack in terms of hardware, software, device drivers, et cetera. And mm -hmm. that's commendable. That's very difficult. Um, even just working with OEMs on the Android side where Android's given to them and they get this great foundational base, that's still extremely difficult. I, I can't imagine what it'd be like to have to pick that base apart and say, this component is an open source. How do we get the open source version of this? Or how do we make an open source version of this? Or, you know, which mainline branch do I connect this to? And, you know, Pure OS, my understanding, it follows the Debian branch, upstream branch. And by the way, that could be completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I believe but, you're right. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. And, and I mean, I'm, again, when I was doing IT consulting and DevOps, you know, Debian was, Debian, you know, the, if you're going to make a server, if you're going to make a whole backend, you're, you're picking either CentOS or Debian, right? And mm -hmm. um, Debian is stable, but I wouldn't say Debian is the most secure. And uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty positive to stick to that assumption that, you know, the, the Librem 5 is a, is a very interesting, compelling product. I know they've had issues. Uh, with getting phones out to people and development kits and mm -hmm. the hardware they're using, my understanding is the same specs as actually your 6P. So um, oh. that's, that's kind of interesting. But you know, I'm not going to sit here and and and, and bash Pearsum. I think what they're doing is a is a good is a good thing for the system. I think we need to open it up more. I think we have to, need to have more competition in the space. 
And um, I think, you know, if, if a company, no matter who they are, the competitor is or not, if a company is trying to put the power of communication back into the hands of the person using the device and not some, you know, user tracking company or, or, or some company that's trying to take or use it out and sell to ad networks. I think that's a good thing. So, um, yeah, the TLDR with that is, you know, the, the Librem uh, five is, is not comparable to copper OS on pixel two security wise, but I think heroes is doing good work and I wish them the best of luck with everything. All right, cool. Um, yeah, and I definitely agree. I'd like to see more competition in the space, especially when you look at things that are less than, say, a thousand dollars. So, um, and actually, I suppose I don't know what it costs right now to to get a phone loaded up with um, what the options are to get a phone loaded up with Copperhead today, and what that might cost. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I understand. My understanding is Pixel ones are, are are pretty inexpensive at this point. That's of course a subjective term to me, but um, I understand that it might be up there for two hundred US. And I think, but I think the Pixel three A is like three fifty US. Hmm. And if that's true, then the Pixel three A is definitely the the better pick. Um, you know, if you if for for anyone listening and yourself, if someone wants Copper to West right now, you guys are gonna have to wait just a little bit longer while we put the finishing touches on our licensing platform, um, and then we're gonna come out with uh, Pixel Three and Pixel Three A and Android Ten, and we can we can get selling to that again. Oh, okay. So what would what would so you're licensing uh, the software? So what will the or I should say the operating system? What is what is that gonna cost? I suppose it's probably a range of possibilities, right? On how yeah. It's- yeah, we're trying to keep it low. Um, we haven't really nailed down the cost yet. I mean, before, you know, before to buy a Pixel 2 64 gig from us of Copper OS was something like 1200 US, which was, I mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's a lot of money for a lot of people. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, even for us just to buy the hardware, it was like $800 to get it sent to us, right? And to work mm-hmm. on it. So, um, you know, the total cost, I think, for Copper OS a, a year ago on top was like 550 US. Uh, and so that would get you, um, you know, three years of, or two years of OS upgrades and three years of security updates. So if you break 550 down by 36, I didn't, I haven't actually done the math in a while. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. So that looks like 15 something a month. It'll probably be in a range of that. Not much higher, not much lower. Hmm. Okay. Well, 550. And then um, previously you had some options such as um, as uh, compiling your own or, or building your own yep. from source. Is that still going to be an option in the future? Yeah, that's still actually open now. Uh, GitHub.com slash Copper uh, All of our sources are source available. Um, feel free to build, compile. If you have any issues, email us, get us at our Slack, uh, tweet at us, whatever you need to do. Um, if you want to do an unofficial port, we had someone approach us about um, a device uh, yesterday. I'm trying to find it quickly. Um, he was looking at supporting the Redmi 6. Um, so I don't know how successful he's going to be, but <laughs> if you want to do an unofficial port of Copper to West, um, you know, get in touch with us. We can give you some guiding tips and, and guidance and whatnot, and then we can look at the security device and see, you know, is this official copper to West and we'll advertise it as such or is it unofficial, but um, yeah, any builders, uh, you know, feel free to look at our sources. Um, about a month ago, we came up with a blog post uh, called the uh, community builders initiative, mm-hmm. which is, um, I don't know if you got to see that or not. That's yeah. I'm looking at the page right here. Oh, very so, cool. Yeah. So yeah, I know more about that. <laughs> yeah. Great. Yeah. So we're, we're looking to bridge, you know, with that, uh, with that program, we're looking to bridge the gap between people who are hobbyist builders and maybe people who want to be a hobbyist builder and maybe try to do something a little bit more with it. Uh, you know, a lot of our high threat model customers, people in the defense contract industry, for example, you know, uh, government agencies, they all self build. Um, so, you know, when they hire people who are builders, it's, it's a very easy transition for them. So, and also other things like nonprofits, you know, they want to also self-build because they want to make sure they know where the signing keys are. Obviously, with the Cop Pro West issue we had last year, everyone's like signing key this, signing key that, right? So, mm-hmm. um, and we're perfectly okay with that. If you're a threat model, you know, if you think CSIS is going to put a black bag over my head and, and, and you know, <laughs> uh, what is it, water drop me or whatever, then you know what? Build it yourself and, and do the signing key stuff yourself and, and you'll be okay and we'll help you along the way. <laughs> Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. All right, cool. So 
So, yeah, so this is a, a program where um, this community builders initiative where people could uh, become builders, sort of official builders for Copperhead. And <laughs> excuse me. Um, participate basically in the licensing and that sort of thing yeah it gets them some free licenses so that if they want to test it out if they want to try to build a business with it if they want to you know consult with a nonprofit or a government agency or something it's essentially bridging the gap between someone who does it for fun and someone who may be looking to make some sort of venture out of it whether that's in the nonprofit or profit space you know we have a lot of experience a lot of experience years of experience dealing with various types of organizations and industries you want to Make sure that these builders, you know, for, for one, it, it sets a bar for us where we say, look, make, you know, there's a prerequisites link there. And it says, look, try not to bug us until you get to this point, right? Which is building Copperhead and understanding signing keys and updates and stuff like that. And it helps us also determine, you know, who's really looking to try to make this a venture and try to make this something they can work with versus someone who's just doing it on the weekends for fun. And on the other hand, we uh, we turn around and we say, okay, well, if you're able to get past this point, we're going to give you some free support. We're going to give you some commercial licenses so you can really try it out and see where you go with it. Oh, huh. it's intriguing. Definitely intriguing. So if somebody is um, participating in this program and they're helping people get it loaded onto their phones, basically, um, what kind of... Um, what kind of arrangements would be made on licensing and such? Would they just get a percentage of, you know, per license um, uh, fees or something like that? Um, it really depends on, on where they want to take it. I mean, if they're building it themselves and they're, you know, deploying it to 5,000, you know, if they have 5,000 de devices, then, um, you know, it probably would be a percentage of the uh, wholesale charge on the services and support. Um, if it's a small thing, who knows if they're working with a nonprofit, we will probably just uh, give them free nonprofit licenses anyways. Mm. Uh, yeah. But it's, it's really, you know, it depends on if they're, if they're in the going to the commercial sense of things um, you know, for example, there's uh, solutions providers who create encrypted messaging apps. They might want to build their own version of Copperhead with some branding or something. We would give them free commercial licenses say, Hey, put this on three devices, try it out. And once you get to like 10 or 20 devices, then we'll start discussing commercial licensing arrangements. Interesting. Okay. Well, neat. Neat. Yeah. And that sounds like a, it sounds like you're heading to a better model. That's going to work overall. Um, <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're, tr we're trying. We've, uh, we've been all over the place. So, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to find something that, that fits and, um, you know, being the uh, primary business development person since the inception of the company has given me a lot of insight into how this market and and, and the respectful uh, industries work, which is, um, you know, having an open source project, you know, and I, this is a big thing, and I'm sure you're following this too, but everyone in the last year and two years has been saying, you know, what's happening with open source? Because, you know, the biggest stocks right now are all companies built in open source, right? Amazon, Facebook. Mm -hmm. Google, Netflix, right? And a lot of them give back to open source, but do they really give enough back? And that's always a really interesting question. Um, and I feel it's funny because even though we're a, a kind of a smallish startup, we've had a lot of experience with this ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, people uh, not fault, not you know, people violating licenses or you know, contributions not being returned back to the product. And and of course, it, the question always is: is what are you going to do about it? Right? Are you going to you gonna make a hacker news post and cry and look for attention, or are you gonna try to? <laughs> you gonna... Yeah, <laughs> and you can't pay rent with tears, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, I think I think really what we're what we're aiming for and where we're going is that putting a, a company, a profitable company, behind an open source or source available product is really what makes it sustainable and profitable. Um, you can find 100,000 examples of open source technology, which is groundbreaking, but went nowhere. And the only time it ever went anywhere is when a commercial, uh, when it was entered in the commercial space, you know, example would be like open VPN, like who doesn't use that, right? But where's the person who made it? How much money have they made from it? You know, are they happy with how much money they've made from it? Or are they paying their bills with it, et cetera, right? So, right. um, and uh, I don't know if you followed the Open VPN thing when it came out. Um, oh, really? Okay, Re look into it. It's actually it's quite fascinating because um, every 
I mean, I use VPN every day. I travel a lot, so I use VPN services all the time. Um, and <laughs> besides WireGuard, which is the next best thing, once it's a little more stable, um, you're probably using OpenVPN or using OpenVPN service so, or a VPN service. So, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so back to the point is, uh, I firmly believe that open source products and projects really can be sustainable, profitable, and secure if they have a company. And that was, that was another thing um, with Copperhead. And uh, excuse me about my little rant for a minute, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, even before our signing key issue, you know, everyone was saying, how do we, how can we trust you? Like, who are you guys? Right. And we said, well, we're, you know, we're Copperhead and this is where we are and this is what we do. And they said, yeah, but what can you do if your government wants to backdoor Copper West? Right. And then you have a few questions. Do you make a nonprofit and try to stand on that on the nonprofit space? Or do you make a company? And 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 we you know we decided that the company aspect would be um, more of a secured uh, foundation because it's a lot harder for a country or or law enforcement agency or something to come in and say, hey, Copperhead, and we want to backdoor you, and we turn around and say, well, guess what? If you backdoor us, you're backdooring your military, and how what would they think about that, right? And I bet they would say a lot of things about that. So. Um, you know, in, ter in terms of the whole open source debate, I think, uh, and, and, and Copperhead thinks that having a profitable company behind an open source project and product is re really will make it sustainable. If you can pay people on payroll and have quarterly reports and, you know, do all the operational stuff, then you can absolutely run an open source project. And that's, I think, what's really important. Well, that's cool. Yeah, one of the biggest problems with open source there, of course, is that as soon as you are making the source available to people, yeah. what keeps them coming back to you? But, That's right. but in this case, it's um, your licensing is going to more or less require it unless people are willing to put a lot more um, effort <laughs> into going ahead and doing their own building, right? Exactly. Why would you... You know, why would you try to rip off a company to make something when it's going to cost you less to work with the company? Hopefully that's right. Yeah. The time it takes somebody to go ahead and set it up might be worth more to them than the cost of going ahead and uh, getting you guys to do it for them. Exactly. Buying license from you. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, one of the biggest problems that I've seen with open source is a lot of the traditional completely open model where you can, you know, get something executable right off the shelf and just use it and never pay anybody back for anything is, is exactly that. Um, yeah. That without people pitching back in open source can wind up missing a lot of its potential. So if, um, you know, if the marketplace isn't operational, then there's no um, the incentive for somebody to build the best product really isn't there. Right. Um, so people do it just out of pride, obviously, but mm -hmm. you know, um, but if you, if you actually had money rolling in, you can put resources on things and get more done than you can. If it's just you and your free time, uh, you know, and you have to keep your day job and that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. The, um, you know, I mean, a lot of people see profits as an evil thing. I certainly do not because, you know, um, the marketplace is how we make certain that people are actually serving other people. So mm -hmm. and and the other side of that is, unfortunately, a lot of the things we get out there in the world for free that aren't actually open source are actually the opposite of what any uh, consumer should be looking for, right? right? So I can get all kinds of useful stuff on this. This is a full up, you know, normal um, Android phone that I needed for some development stuff we're working on right now. And the problem with this is I get all kinds of stuff for free on here. And the problem is most consumers look at that and they just think, well, see, it's free. Well, yeah. how could I do better than free? Well, well, here's the problem. <laughs> it's not free because you're not the uh, consumer. <laughs> so you are the product. Yeah, yeah. Okay. all your data is being served up to other people. That's why I use the term digital panopticon. Because you don't know, um, you know what they're looking at, when they're looking, what, and basically have to assume that every little piece of data on this thing 
is being uh, collected and used by other people. Yeah. So, um, so how do we find a way? Maybe you've got ideas of your own. Obviously, you are working on an effort that's about privacy. But how do we? Um, what do you? What is your vision? Maybe maybe Copperhead is it. Maybe that is your vision. But what would your vision be of the best way? to help free people from the digital panopticon, meaning help people break away from having all of their data collected and sold uh, to these different parties? That's an interesting question. Um, and yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, what you're saying is, is hundred percent correct. Even before pre Copperhead, we noticed this, right. And, 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 and that's, kind of the interesting thing you learn when you're in the Android space is, you know, before up to this year, when Google got hit with this uh, European Union, uh, ant- or I think it's European Commission, European Commission antitrust suit, uh, Google gives Android away for free. They give it to OEMs and they say, here, you get all this stuff, Google Maps, blah, 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 for free. Just make sure it fits this compliance or, you know, make sure it, it runs past compatibility test suite and, uh, you know, CDD. And, you know, why is that? Well, it's because Google makes way more money off your data than it does off of selling an operating system license. And uh, that's terrifying, right? That's mm-hmm. absolutely terrifying. Um, absolutely. I, I think it's, I still think it's crazy that people are shocked by this. But then again, you know, people like you and me, you know, we're in this and we see this. And, you know, when you're in the fish tank and you're looking out, everything looks like it's supposed to. But when you're outside looking in, everything looks different. So, mm-hmm. um you know what uh, the question you pose is what you know what do i see well <clears throat> i i think there's a bunch of different avenues uh to to move forward with this i mean one interesting avenue i don't necessarily like it but i think it is kind of interesting to bring up is and i don't remember who was uh setting this project up but so, some people and some companies and i'll set it up so you can sell your user data um for a profit mhm and it's the blockchain based stuff right that's what i'm seeing <laughs> Oh, <laughs> blockchain. Yeah. Now I'm actually talking to you on an Ubuntu machine using the Brave browser. Mm-hmm. And part of what Brave does mm-hmm. is if I actually choose to watch ads, I get paid yeah. for watching the ads. And so I think it's really neat that there are people trying to go after these approaches that take that model where you're just the cattle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you're being sold for meat, you know. Yeah. Uh, turn it on its head and put some power back in your hands. Um, so that if you watch an ad that maybe you make some money off watching an ad, or if, um, if your data is going to be harvested, well, why not sell it? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I find that pretty interesting. Brave is doing, I wasn't actually speaking about brave, but now that you brought that up, um, brave is doing fantastic work. Uh, they have incredibly talented technologists on their team. Um, and yeah, the brave attention token, I think that's really interesting, right? Like, and I think it's cool that you're able to, uh, I guess, curate who you think deserves your attention. And I think that's really important. Actually Copperhead at one point, our website was signing up for the beta of that brave attention token. Hmm. Um, uh, we took that down eventually with all the other donation based stuff, but, um, yeah, I think that's a compelling, I think that is a compelling feature. And I think. Um, one aspect of that, you know, we, we, I was talking about multiple one is, yeah, I mean, if, if it's giving you back the power, as you said, giving the power back to the user to say, you know, I don't want X number X company in, you know, this country to have my data, but I'm okay with, uh, purism having it or Mozilla having it or Tor having it, right. Maybe they need it for something. And for that data that I'm giving them, they will give me this back. I think that's pretty cool. Um, I don't necessarily think that's the answer, but I think that is a start. And I think Mm -hmm. um, in combination with the rest of the uh, avenues, I think that that definitely gives us, gets us closer to a more uh, balanced uh, um, connected world. Um, I think regulation is incredibly important, which is funny for someone running an enterprise to say, but Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, privacy regulation, like if you look at something like the GDPR, GDPR has flipped the entire industry on its head. Um, you know, when it was when it was passed very quickly, everyone was like, "What are we going to do now? Like, where's our data going? What's happening?" 
And now, you know, we have some good things, you have some bad things, you know, bad things is every time you go to a website, you have 300 pop-ups telling you, Hey, we send you this and this is what we do. And this, and then click okay, or click no, or here's the X or where's the X. <laughs> and that kind of sucks. But the good thing is, is this has created a whole industry of, of privacy consultants who come in and say, look, this is where you break GDPR compliance. This is where you break HIPAA compliance and stuff like that. And I think that's really important. And I think um, more countries, including, um, I see you're in Indiana. Um, I think more countries, including ours, uh, should be passing this sort of stuff, which is, you know, it's, it's not right for uh, other countries to profit off of our, of our user data. Um, I don't think it's, it makes sense for companies to be set up that profit off of user data that we don't know about, um, especially consider that user data can end up anywhere. If you look at the Cambridge Analytica stuff, you know, nefarious psychological surveys on Facebook turn into changing elections. And that's mm -hmm. an incredible amount of power for, for a technology to have, right? So I think um, the second thing is uh, government regulation. We should, we should be really passing laws and legislation to analyze what's happening and you know, with the advent of IoT and, and every device everywhere having an operating system, I think it's important to uh, have legislation. I think, you know, something like smart TVs, like the fact that I just bought a new TV and and I actually go out of my way to look for a dumb TV because I don't want a TV <laughs> right. spying on me, right? It's like... Yeah. like yeah, the other room here, I, I basically take another machine and I'm running... I hole. Linux Mint on that one actually right, right. very well mm -hmm. for just an entertainment system. Mm -hmm. And I want the, I don't want that TV itself to be anything but a dumb monitor. Right. No, <laughs> so exactly. It's not connected to the internet. I, I don't want it connected to the internet. I want a device that I control to connect to the internet. So, right. Um, and, you know, and if it's for entertainment purposes only, well, then maybe I'm not as worried about it. But even then, even if somebody says, well, this guy likes this type of entertainment, right. the other type of entertainment, and they consolidate all the data, or or um, there's a history of some of these smart TVs being used in denial of service attacks and things like <laughs> right, that, right. It's, yeah. it's just nice to know that I've got more control over my device, so mm -hmm. none of that can happen as easily. Yeah, no, exactly. When I and so my my eventually, first of all, I couldn't find a dumb TV. I mean, I could buy a big monitor, but I wanted mm -hmm. a TV. So my um, my eventual setup is to have a to not give the TV uh, internet access. Besides, mm -hmm. uh, give it uh, yeah, I don't give it internet access. It's hooked to an HDMI to my PS4, which then runs as the media server, and then I use stuff like Plex and whatever else, right? Right, and, and I have a Pi hole that's running on a Raspberry Pi to try to minimize the amount of ads coming out of my home IP address. But like, it's crazy. I have to have that set up just to have a TV, right? And yeah. so, so I think legislation should should be passed to to minimize this stuff. I don't think a smart TV, for example, should be allowed to um, take your user data. And may, and maybe we should go back to the first avenue, which is the, the TV should say, Hey, are you interested in giving your user data for this program? Maybe it's like PBS, or maybe it's like blue planet or something, or maybe it's like a nonprofit Greenpeace is doing a documentary and you say, yeah, you know what? Cool. No problem. But it yeah. shouldn't be unbridled. Yeah. Yeah. I, I get where you're coming from. And oftentimes I think that a lot of the answer needs to be out there in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. where, and I think it is possible, but I think the biggest problem is that a lot of these TV set manufacturers have gone the way that Google and Microsoft mm -hmm. and all these other companies have gone where they're going to subsidize giving you hardware because they know they can collect your data. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it's a problem. And the problem is right now is that it takes a lot of conscious effort to get privacy, to mm -hmm. get your privacy back or retain your privacy. Um, whereas what we would like to see is a world where you would have to consciously agree to mm -hmm. share that information instead. So it's really turned on its head. Um, and that's, that's obviously a problem. So someday maybe we'll we'll figure out some answers here and um but i think there's probably a, a big marketplace out there that hasn't been tapped yet for people who want secure private devices mm -hmm. and we don't you know we're not all doing military planning or anything like that but you know i i don't want i don't want somebody i don't just want random people collecting on all my 
um, you know, political interests and right. social activities and all these things in order to come back with some sort of a, you know, Chinese styled uh, uh, social scoring system <laughs> or anything right. like that. But, you know, I mean, if you look at what's happened to media today, we practically have that. So, yeah, um, it's just as being done by corporations instead of a government. And, right. Right. And then we can always argue about what the difference is. <laughs> right. Right. Accountability. Yeah. And 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 so that and, and, and that's a great I'm going to dovetail on that real quickly just to explain the third avenue, I believe, is really important, which is uh, for profit enterprises. Um, getting involved in the privacy security debate. I think um, it's a lot. Uh, I think the privacy debate will have a lot more gumption behind it if you have companies like Brave or you have nonprofits like Mozilla Tor and you know, other companies that are going to come in the next couple of years to come out and say, look, we can make a profit without taking user data. So we can do it. Why can't you guys? Right. And I think that's really important. And that's, that's mm-hmm. sort of where, that's where Copperhead stands in that. So you have those three, you have, Often user data collection, you have, uh, you know, government regulation, and then you have for profit enterprises, um, creating a profit for secure technology and privacy. And, I, and I'm hoping that those three are good enough and will get us to the spot before AI is able to come out and, you yeah. know, blow through a 500 million person data set in five minutes and totally just be able to understand everything about you. I think I really hope we get there before that happens. No kidding. No kidding. Yeah, that's bad news. We don't. We don't, we, we value some, obviously we both value privacy here. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, and it, it's, and it, it's it, what you said is correct. You said, you know, it's really hard to, or it takes concentrated effort to, to, to live a privacy lifestyle. And I think that is, a, that is a big hurdle that I think we all, you know, anyone in the for-profit space looking at this stuff or nonprofit space, we need to really, we really, really need to, to, uh, um, deal with. We need to um, look at. I mean, you know, if you're a privacy person and you're at any family dinner, whoa, and then your family, of course, your family members gonna say, "Well, I got nothing to hide," or "I don't care if Google knows about me." And and I turn <laughs> to them and I say, you know, how can you, you know, do you? Do you I, I, I list. Yeah. I list. I list several examples of why they should be concerned, and. You know, some of it's just political. You know, what mm-hmm. happens when you've got a government that decides this, this has happened before across history where right. um, like the old Soviet Union, if you disagreed with the government on certain points, that was it. You yeah. were considered insane, clinically yeah. insane. And the government had the authority to decide who was sane and who was not sane. And right. that's that's a big issue right there. Mm-hmm. Um and so, you know, your political views could get you, uh, assi- you know, thrown into an insane asylum or mm-hmm. or uh, let's just say would have certain rights taken away from you mm-hmm. uh, as a result um, and, you know, get you under extra scrutiny and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. The other thing that I'll, I'll tell people is that um, when you when you go to a public restroom and you use the stall, you close the door. Yeah, right. 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 So, so is that because you have something to hide? Yeah. It's, it's it's the inherently we want privacy. There are certain things we just don't want to share. It doesn't mean you have something to hide, right? Yeah. So, So there's that area in between where it's like, you know, but then one other thing that I'll point out, there was a book put out by a guy named, uh, Harvey Silvergate a few years back. Have you heard of this? It's called no, three felonies a day. And, the idea, the premise of the book, I think it came out in 2011 or something back then. It's, it's a few years back now. But the premise of the book is that the code of laws in the United States is so complex, you cannot possibly ever understand all the laws, the entire system of laws. And what it means, this guy believes that um, that your average American U.S. citizen um, is – is committing three felonies a day and they probably don't even know about it. And that right there turns into a case of selective enforcement. Mm-hmm, right. So, so if people suddenly decide, well, this guy's now inconvenient because he holds these political views, maybe he just values privacy or something like that. Right. And he's an advocacy for privacy. And now we think that's inconvenient because he's going to mess with the government and some corporate collection efforts. So what happens now, now that you've angered them, could they decide, to say, well, let's target him. We've already got all this data. 
So what can we do? Well, they can find something, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, they can find something for everybody. They can find something to ridicule you, or um, or uh, you know, uh, cut cut down um, your your legitimacy, um, or attack your character based on nothing. Attack your character, yeah. or even you know, with the Harvey Silvergate thing, you know, um, find one of those three felonies you're committing every day, mm-hmm. and uh, actually throw you in jail, make you a felon take your rights away permanently. So um, people don't recognize it, but there is something to be lost that's very real for everybody. And I I don't know how we get that message out, but um, anyhow, sorry. Sorry to go down all these rabbit holes, but it's an interesting topic. And I think privacy's, um, obviously you and I both think privacy is a very important topic and it's good to talk to somebody who um, has a similar set of values on the topic. With that, I should probably let you go. Um, it, it's been great talking with you, James. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, I definitely look forward to seeing uh, Copperhead reemerge. So do you, do you have a, uh, do you have an ETA for when we'll see Copperhead uh, available again? Yeah. So our sources are available right now. So if you're looking to get involved in our builder initiative, uh, you know, you can get started immediately. Um, if you don't, you just want to build it, go right ahead. That's there. <clears throat> um, we're still doing hardware sales. Uh, you know, if you have a company you want to deal with, you can contact us um, in terms of, you know, the average one person, two person consumer. Um, you're going to have to wait until about October. We're moving on to Android 10. Uh, we want to make sure, you know, all of Copper West is on Android 10. And then we're going to support Pixel 3, Pixel 3a. And that's when we're going to start uh, giving out and processing our, our licensing platform. And, and that's when things are going to pick up again. Oh, all right. Great. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to share with um, anybody that's in the audience? Uh, no, I just... Uh, Mark, I appreciate you uh, speaking to me. Um, I think your rabbit holes are fantastic. I mean, <laughs> when sometimes you wonder if you are Alice in the in the Wonderland, right? I mean, 20 years ago, if I was to tell my grandfather, hey, my TV's sending data to China, he would say, what? <laughs> like, that's crazy, right? Or my car can turn off remotely now, you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. so... I don't know if it's too much of a rabbit hole at all, but I personally enjoy I personally enjoy it. And yeah, it's it's nice to speak to you and I appreciate you letting me talk about my company and, and Copperless the product and uh and I will wish you all the best and um I look forward to speaking to you again, hopefully soon. Yeah, I wish you the best as well, James. Uh really do appreciate you taking the time to contact me and to speak today. And um I I expect we'll speak again in the future. Thanks a lot. All right, Mark and Ethical Developer Group. Thanks so much, guys. Take care. Take care.